start the meditation by articulating to yourself what you want to do for the hour. To stay with the breath, to stay with the body, or to work on a particular problem that you know you have in, in the meditation. It's always good to have a clear idea of what you want to accomplish. Because that makes it easier to notice when you're wandering off, and easier to get back on course. Because you remind yourself, this is what you wanted to do for the hour, why you're not doing it. This quality is called determination. It's one of the perfections. In fact, it contains all of the other perfections within it. As Buddha said, determination has four qualities. There's discernment, in other words, being discerning in your goals, choosing good goals for yourself, and then discerning in how you're going to go about attaining those goals. That's the first quality. The second quality is truthfulness. Once you've made up your mind to do something, you really stick with it. The third quality is generosity. There are things you're going to have to give up in order to attain that goal. Think of the practice as like a game of chess. You're going to have to lose some of your pieces. If you're not willing to lose your pieces, you're not going to win. You have to decide that some pieces are more valuable than others, and you're willing to give them up. And finally, there's calm, the quality that allows you to stick with it when things are not going well, and to not get too excited when things are going well, because you want to bring the mind to a state of balance. And you know that you've chosen a good goal for yourself when you find that when you have attained the goal, there is a sense of peace. Those are the four main aspects of a good determination. And as I said, the perfections are all in there. The perfection of discernment and the perfection of goodwill come under discernment. It starts by realizing there are some things that you like to do that are going to give bad results, and other things that you don't like to do are going to give good results. You have to learn how to talk yourself into doing the right thing in both, both cases, not letting your likes or dislikes run things, but your perception of what's going to be skillful and what's not. In other words, discernment is strategic. It's not just knowing about emptiness or not self or dependent core rising. It's looking at your mind and figuring it out. What are the obstacles? What's the allure of the things that are unskillful? And what image have you built in your mind about things that are our skillful that's getting in the way? Can you get past those images? Can you replace them with new ones? Can you see that the allure of the unskillful course is not worth the results you're going to get? That's basic discernment. And it goes together with goodwill. As the Buddha said, if you have good ill will for anyone, that's wrong view. The desire for anybody to suffer is wrong view. So you want to make sure that whatever your goal is, that it is conducive to genuine happiness, and that means a happiness that doesn't harm anybody. Because if your happiness is harmful to other people, they're not going to stand for it. It's not going to last. Which is why goodwill has to go both into your choice of a goal and into your choice of the means of attaining that goal. As for the quality of truthfulness, this covers the perfection of truthfulness and all the also the perfection of virtue. Truthfulness is not just telling the truth, but also means sticking with something that you've made up your mind is really good. And the, virtu <coughs> and the virtues of the precepts carry that principle through. You make up your mind that you're going to avoid harmful behavior. 
then you stick with it. You're mindful, you're alert, and you're ardent to make sure that you remember the precepts and you're alert to what you're actually doing. It was a case years back when one of John Fuang's students came to the monastery and she saw everybody else take the eight precepts, so she decided she'd take the eight precepts too. Later that afternoon, as she was walking past a guava tree in the monastery, there was one instance when one of the guavas was on the branch and the next instant it was in her mouth, almost without thinking. And John Fuang happened to see that and said, hey, I thought you were taking the eight precepts. It's a case of no mindfulness and no alertness. If you're going to stick with the precepts, you have to be mindful, you have to be alert, all of which are the qualities we try to develop here as we meditate. And you have to be ardent on the days when you don't feel like holding to the precept or something comes along that's really tempting. It tempts you to break the precept, you have to remind yourself, no, you put up an effort. This brings in another. Another one of the perfections, which is the perfection of persistence, the perfection of effort itself. As for generosity, that includes giving, it includes renunciation. Being willing to give to others is often a good way of getting your determination. You realize that many of the things that you want in life do require the cooperation of other people. So if you share with them, it's easier to get their cooperation. As for renunciation, that deals specifically with renouncing your sensual desires. Because a lot of the things in life that are really worth fighting for, really worth struggling for, will require that you put up with physical difficulties. You have to be willing to give up, <coughs> put up with pain. And so you learn how to replace that with the pleasure of concentration. People often miss this point. They think that renunciation is totally barren. You give up good things and there's nothing much to show. Actually, you're giving up candy so you're going to have gold. The pleasure of renunciation is the pleasure of concentration. It's like gives you the strength you need. In this way, giving some things up actually gives you more strength. And finally, under the principle of calm, you have equanimity and patience. Patience, realizing that it's going to take a while sometimes, especially if it's a large object or a large goal you've got. And so the secret to patience is not focusing on how difficult things are, but it's focusing on where your strengths are. And you rely on those strengths to keep going. And finally, there's equanimity, which realizes that there are a lot of things in life that we will not be able to accomplish due to our karma, other people's karma. And often beforehand, you don't know what it's going to be. But you can't let that get you, get you down. You've got to have the determination to do the best you can. And if it so happens that circumstances outside beyond your control get in the way. You don't let yourself get upset because you realize, okay, even though the outside goal you may have aimed at is you haven't attained yet, still you developed all these good qualities in mind, and those are what count. Those are the treasures you can actually keep with you. I've been reading recently about a French diplomat, Talleyrand who for 50 years fought for the idea that France should have a constitutional monarchy. And this was during the time of the revolutions, the time of Napoleon, the time of the Restoration. And he faced one setback after another, after another, after another, but he never gave up. He kept springing back, springing back. And finally, after almost 50 years, he was able to get things settled in France, so it did have a constitutional monarchy. He 
And so think of equanimity not as being resigned to things, but as a kind of resilience. That if the opportunity doesn't come now, it may come later. Remembering that in the meantime, you have developed your perfections. Because this world we live in is an imperfect world. You look around you. So many things that people have fought for, so many things that people have accomplished, then get washed away. But you can't let yourself get discouraged over that fact. Do you think of all the people whose lives have been ruined by warfare? The things they wanted, the things they dreamed about. And then they see society collapsing all around them. What's good about the Buddhist teachings is it gives you something to live for, something to focus on, even though there are social forces beyond your control. You develop the perfections of the mind in an imperfect world. Because it's the qualities of the mind that really count. And another one of the Buddhist teachings, he calls those your treasures, your noble treasures. Which, unlike the usual treasures of the world, can't be affected by fire or water. Or all the other social forces out there that can take all your money away and make it useless, make it worthless. So as you look at your life and look at your meditation, think of the Buddha, think of the great Johns. They were people of strong determination. In the Buddha's case, he was looking for something deathless in a world where nobody had found it before. And yet he stuck with his crust. As for the Johns, many of them came from very poor backgrounds. And yet they were able to find the deathless, too. It was through their determination. So think about the qualities of determination, think about the perfections of the mind as your main accomplishment. And that's how you find perfect happiness in an imperfect world.